Hey everybody, today we are going to be going through Ephesians chapter 4, and over the last few weeks we've gone through Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, and it's all been leading up to the 4 through 6 chapter. So when we jump into chapters 1 through 3, we're wading through a lot of dense theological information. It's a little bit intense for everybody. And now when we get to chapter four, it's like taking a breath and saying, okay, how do we respond to these deep theological truths that Paul has been unpacking for these first few chapters? So I want to start off by saying Blake did an incredible job last week. Um, He actually unpacked one of my favorite verses in Ephesians, if not my favorite verse in Ephesians. It's Ephesians um, chapter 3, verse 10, and it says this, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. To think about the reality of God's plans and purposes in Christ from before the foundation of the world, being revealed to all creation through the church is such a overwhelming thought, I think, and it's overwhelming to me. This is this is the hinge point of the book of Ephesians, and I think that when you can when you read that, it can get a little bit overwhelming. But what Paul wants to do is set up the theology, and then he's going to move into chapter four, and he's going to get really practical. And so where we were kind of having our eyes opened to the reality of what has happened in Christ. Now he's saying, boots on the ground. This is how you live it out, and this is how you walk it out. As we do every week, we are going to listen to the scriptures being read aloud. So we're going to listen to Ephesians chapter 4 together. So put away any distractions, anything that might take your attention away from just absorbing yourself in the drama of Ephesians chapter 4. But before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and learn from you. Um, Open our hearts, open our minds. May we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you so that we can understand and see what the scriptures are saying and what they're asking of us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, He led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to man. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might feel all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, 
makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned from Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former matter of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put away falsehood let every one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, and that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I grew up in a pastor's home. I grew up around ministry for as long as I can remember. I was essentially born in a pew. I was, I was in church from my earliest days. And so I was really well acquainted with what church looked like, what, what we were supposed to do, the the ins and outs of, of this life that some people find themselves in from the, from the earliest point of their lives. And it was something that I was super well acquainted with. But when I became a teenager, um, I, I started to really struggle. I started to really struggle with what this faith looked like lived out practically. So essentially, what I had in my church experience was I had Ephesians 1 through 3 preached to me every weekend. That's that's essentially where we lived in those deep theological truths. But then when I went home, it was a completely different story. We We weren't kind to each other in my family. And my parents were pastors. We We didn't treat each other with respect. And a lot of times I asked myself, if I'm a Christian and if I'm a Jesus follower, then why am I so mean? And why am I so angry? And it wasn't until a little bit later in, in high school when I realized, God, if you're real, um, this couldn't have been what you intended for us as the church, for us to be so deeply unhappy in our daily lives, and then come and worship you on the weekends. It was really frustrating for me, but it actually pushed me deeper into the reality of my relationship with the Lord. And it was really, really good for me. And so I began looking into not only Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, but what does it look like to live out Ephesians 4 through 6. And so as I was preparing to teach this, I, I have to be honest with you, there, there wasn't a time where I was studying that I didn't cry, <laughs> that I didn't have an emotional response to the scriptures. But I will say this, that the emotional response is as a result of me going to the scriptures with my mind and seeking to comprehend it, seeking to understand what is Paul and therefore God asking of us. And so 
as we approach this today, I just wanted you to know it's incredibly meaningful to me. Um, and we're just going to walk through the text right now. And if you have any questions, make sure that you, you put them in the chat if you're watching this live, or you can email us at bible at churchonthemove.com. Okay, so let's go into this first verse. It says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. There he is. He's reminding us that he's a prisoner again. This is really significant information. But then he's urging us to do something. He's urging us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. So you can think of it this way. Think of the word worthy. This word in Greek is axios. And it actually means weight or scale. It has the implication of justice or measurement. And so if you're, you have your walk on one side and you have calling on the other side, and in the middle is this idea of worthy, worthiness, or weightiness, you could say. So let's say on this side, you put the calling this is what we've been exploring all through Ephesians 1 through 3. And the weight of this calling is on the other side, there's this walk. There's this daily application, this daily forward motion for those who are in Christ that we're supposed to appraise and weigh out what, what is it worth when Paul asks us to walk worthy of the calling with which he, we have been called, he's saying, weigh this out. What are, what are you supposed to do? Based on Ephesians 1 through 3, and in Ephesians 1, we see this prayer that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened. So with the enlightening of the Holy Spirit, and then at the end of chapter 3, where we see that we would be strengthened to know and comprehend the unknowable love of Christ. With all of these things at play and our union in Christ being a present reality, what it does it mean to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called? And so he goes on to kind of describe this with uh, some virtues. He says in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. I love the way that William Barclay defines these virtues. But first, we need to understand the context with which these virtues are being applied. So let's think about what does the early church look like? What does an early church look like? It would have been a collection of people from different demographics, ethnic backgrounds. It would have been men and women. It would have been citizens and freed slaves. And, and there would have been slaves included in that. So people who had no legal rights within the community. And then Jews and Gentiles and people from all moral walks of life. So all types of different backgrounds. And perhaps most notably, people from elite classes. So very rich people. All the way down the social scale to homeless people. So you have this huge conglomeration of diverse backgrounds and ethnicities all meeting in the same place, worshiping Jesus. So this is how Paul says that we are to walk worthy of this calling when we find ourselves in this context of believers. Humility um, is the first word he uses, and it is actually a word that the Christian faith coined. So in Greek, the word for humility had a completely negative connotation. So before Christianity, humility was not considered to be a virtue at all. The ancient world looked on humility as something to be despised. So humility did not have positive connotations. In the days before Jesus, Barclay says, humility was considered cowering, cringing, servile, ignoble, and yet Christianity sets it to the very forefront of the virtues. So where does this idea of Christian humility come from? And what does it involve? So humility, as Paul is, understands it and is submitting it to us, is it comes from this appropriate self-awareness. 
So not from comparing ourselves to others, but by seeing ourselves in light of who God is. So we have to see ourselves. In order to be humble, we have to see ourselves in light of who God is. And the reality of this situation is, is that we are deeply loved, deeply loved, but we are utterly dependent, okay? So humility is seeing ourselves in the appropriate light, in light of who God is, as deeply loved and utterly dependent. So Barclay says this, he says, we are creatures. And for the creature, there can be nothing but humility in the presence of the Creator. Christian humility is based on the sight of self, the vision of Christ, and the realization of God. So then there's gentleness. Now, gentleness can also be understood as meekness. And this is strength under control. I think we can all think of that person who is incredibly strong, but they just seem to have so much self-control. You kind of wonder, how is that possible? How is that happening? Well, it's this idea of gentleness or meekness. So Aristotle defines it. It's a Greek word, prautes, and it's the midpoint between being too angry and never being angry at all. So the person who is praus, Okay, I'm speaking Greek here, but I do not know Greek. I will learn it one day, but this is um, a Greek word, praus, is the one who is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. So to put that another way, the person who is meek is the one who is stirred by indignation at the wrongs and sufferings of others, but is never moved to anger by any personal wrongs and insults. So gentleness or meekness can also be defined as this. It's our passions and our instincts under complete control. And humanity, people, we're not able to do this in and of ourselves. So meekness, true meekness, is our passions and our instincts submitted completely to God. So then we move on to this word patience. It can also mean long-suffering. And it describes a spirit which will never give in and which, because it endures to the end, will reap the reward. Long-suffering. It also indicates the kind of patience which has the power to take revenge but never does so. It has the power to take revenge but never does so. The best way to connect it to the New Testament idea is 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And this is how it describes, how Peter describes the Lord. He says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is far more patient with us than we would ever be with ourselves or with others. He is slow to anger. And this is this idea of long suffering, waiting it out, giving giving every opportunity and every chance. So then you come to this idea of bearing with one another in love. So love in this context is unconquerable goodwill or benevolence, and it means that no matter what, it seeks the highest good of the other. So then you have these, you have these four virtues, but they are all culminated in this one idea of being eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So the four previous virtues lead to peace, They lead to right relationships with one another in the power of the Spirit. And these four virtues lead to the obliteration of self. And that sounds really scary. But Paul has just spent the last three chapters describing the reality that who you are and that who I am is completely and utterly safe in Christ. You may hear the definitions for those four virtues and hear what it means to be eager to maintain the unity and think, does this really mean that I have to lay myself down? And and yes, it does, but it means that you are completely and utterly safe in Christ and therefore you can do it. Why? Because we are cared for. But not only that, 
in Christ, we have a place of high honor and esteem. So it's important to remember this, though, that it's only in Christ, and that's not something that we achieve on our own. And that's what Ephesians 1 through 3 did such a beautiful job of outlining for us. And when we begin to live our lives from that place, from that heavenly perspective, we begin to long for that for other people. And we want to invite them into the peace that we experience. But that means that our way of doing things, our old way of doing things has to die. So let's look at verse four. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So that's a lot of ones, one after the other after the other. And then it ends with who, but God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So let's unpack that just a little bit. I want to say one thing that I think is so incredible about verse 4. It says, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. So there's a call that has gone out. It's a, it's a general call. But then there's a hope that's associated with that call. And that hope is Jesus. And then it says that it's your call. So it's a call to everyone but it's also a call that is specific to you. And there is a hope that is specific to your calling, and it is Jesus. And so your calling and my calling are irrevocably linked to the person of Jesus. We can't separate those two things. And I think sometimes we try, and it just doesn't work. We we don't know who we are apart from him because we were always only ever intended to be found in him. And in him is our home, in him is our identity, in him is our safety, in him is our consolation. And you see all these repetitions of one, 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 one. And you might start to think, well, am I going to lose myself? And I would submit to you this. Jesus doesn't make us look less like ourselves. In fact, when we're with him and when we're in him, we can be even more like ourselves. So a lot of people look at the church and look at this idea of unity as there's no diversity. Well, there's a little analogy that I like to think about, and it's it's about a salad. Okay, so bear with me. But there are a few different ways you could eat a salad. And one is the typically American way that we eat salad, which is this. We put a ton of ingredients into a bowl and then we smother it in ranch or whatever dressing of choice we might have. I personally like ranch dressing, and sometimes I have been known to put a lot of ingredients in a bowl and smother them in ranch. So then they all taste like ranch. And so you might think all the ingredients are in the bowl. We're going to smother some Jesus on it, and then it's just all going to look the same. And that's just not what the intent is here. And then there's a weird way to eat a salad. And I know that we've all met those people who cannot have their food touching, but have you ever seen somebody eat a salad that way? Where there's just these separate like compartments of ingredients and you eat them all separately? That is a weird way to eat a salad. And I know there are some of you out there that might eat your salad that way and it's weird. Now, the last way to eat a salad is the right way. And the right way to eat a salad is to chop up all the ingredients. You have a variety of expressions and experiences and tastes and flavors. You throw them all in the bowl, and then you drizzle a little bit of olive oil on it, some salt and pepper. And the only thing that you're doing is enhancing the flavor that's already there. And that's what it means for us all to be unified in Christ. We're enhancing what is already there, what what Jesus has brought about in the resurrection and reconciliation and redemption of our lives is God's original intent for us, that what was always meant to be in humanity would rise to the surface and shine. Like we talked about in Ephesians 3.10, where the church would make known to all of creation what God's manifold wisdom actually is. And that, that is unity.
Okay, so let's jump into verse seven. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, have you ever read a passage of scripture and wondered, hmm, I have no idea what that means. I'm going to move on and come back to that later. Um, I have to admit that I have done that several times with these few verses. And so it was actually really helpful for me to take some time to study them out because I think sometimes when we study or when we read, we think, oh, I know what that means or that's not a super big deal. I can kind of just skim over that, which is okay to do sometimes, but this is a lifelong relationship that we have with the Bible. So we're eventually going to come back to it and we'll have more tools in our tool belt to be able to unpack what those verses mean. Maybe look back on some scriptures to understand exactly what they're saying. And that's exactly what I did. Let's take this apart a little by little. Um, he says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says when he ascended on high. So this idea of him ascending on high is the note of victory. Okay. And then we want to no, we want to keep in mind that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities, rulers, powers, and dominion, like we read in Ephesians 1. And so this is to be read from the perspective of victory. And what Paul is actually quoting, he's actually quoting an Old Testament verse here. He's quoting Psalm 68. So it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. So back in the day, when someone would win a battle or a war, the victor would come through and they would have all the captives following behind them, everyone that that they took into captivity because they won the war. So he led a host of captives and you might be thinking, hmm, who are those captives? And um, I would submit to you that to take a look over at um, Colossians chapter two, it says this in verse 13, he says, and you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Sounds really familiar. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So you've got these rulers and authorities put to open shame in him, triumphing over them in the cross. And then it says this, and he gave gifts to men. So, and we know we're going to get into what exactly those gifts are here in a little bit. But in verses 9 and 10, Paul feels the need to explain himself, but it might actually add to the confusion. So we're going to slow down and look at that. In saying, verse 9, in saying he ascended, what does it mean that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So there's a couple different ways to interpret this idea of descending. So some people think that descending means he descended into the lower regions of the earth, meaning when he died and, and when he was crucified, he went to Sheol, he went to the place of the dead, and there's other places in scripture that can kind of corroborate that idea. But I think within the context of the chapter, there might be something a little bit closer to what Paul intends here. So it says he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. So I think, and some other scholars do too, and it's okay to disagree, but I do think that this is talking about his incarnation. And he then says at the end of verse 10 that he might fill all things. So you have this descent in his incarnation, his ascension, in his seating at the right hand of the Father, and that then him filling all things. Well, what does that mean but that the Holy Spirit is given as a gift? 
So in John 16, verse 7, Jesus says he must return to the Father so that the helper would come. So who is like him? Who is another helper that is like him? So I would submit this, that it is probably talking about both the incarnation, descent, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, that he might fill all things. Okay, so what are these gifts? In verse 11, it says this, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. There are several spiritual gifts talked about in the New Testament, but Paul is focusing on five roles for equipping the saints specifically. So in verse 12, it says, To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. He gave these gifts, the gift of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherds, teachers. Why? So that we would grow up. So these roles are for the equipping of the saints for ministry. And a lot of times we think of these people as the ministers. But I want you to know that if you are listening to this, you are a minister and you are being equipped for ministry. So this Greek word for equip, it's similar to the idea of surgery or setting a bone or making something right. So these Roles were given to the church to make something the way that it always was meant to be. So this word saints, too, I want to talk about that, to equip the saints. This word is associated with holiness. So what does it mean to be holy? It essentially means this, to be set apart for God's purposes So saints are those who have been set apart for God's holy purposes. And based on Ephesians 1 through 3, if we are in Christ, we fit the bill. So what does it mean to be mature? What does it mean to grow up? To be mature is to be Christ referencing. So he is the source and he is our authority. So there's something that's interesting. Paul says that we're not supposed to be children, or he doesn't want us to be like children. But then in the Gospels, we see Jesus saying something that seems contradictory. He says that if you want to come to me, you have to come as a child. And they're not actually contradicting themselves. There's a vulnerability and a dependence that co- dependence that comes with what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you're coming to me, you have to come to me with this, with this obedient dependence upon me. And then what Paul is saying, he's specifically referencing the immaturity and the thinking. We need to be developed in our thinking. We don't need to think like children anymore. We need to be mature. And so he he makes this reference to children, but then he says, that you wouldn't be tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. The interesting thing about that is this. Okay, have you ever been caught in the ocean in a wave? It is horrible. I have. I have been tossed over by a wave and it's almost like you might as well just stay down there because you know another wave is coming and you are all disoriented. You can't catch your breath. You can't figure out where you are. You can't really, you can't catch your bearings. And so when you stand up, you could be facing any number of directions. And before you know it, another wave is going to come and hit you. And what Paul is saying is that we need to grow up, we need to be mature, so that these waves don't just come and hit us and disorient us and knock us off balance. And so he's saying this because there's a battle going on between truth and lies. So he's just outlined this truth for us, this reality that is that is should be at the forefront of our minds in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3. But there's also the reality that there are lies, that there's human cunning, 
There's craftiness in deceitful schemes. And so what is Paul doing here? So he says this, he says, rather, in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, to be Christ referencing, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So what is the speaking the truth in love? What is it really? This is a scary scary phrase, I think, for some of us because we don't understand what it means to speak the truth in love. But in, when we think of Jesus as the truth and reality that is found in Jesus as the thing that needs to be spoken out of our mouths, then it becomes so much more simple. We become those who have been ourselves saved and sanctified and set apart. And therefore, we testify of this salvation that we ourselves have received. And that is speaking the truth in love, testifying to the truth that is in Jesus. So when we talk to people about Jesus, when we talk to people about the truth that we have found in Christ, we are loving them. So, John 17, Jesus prays that we might be one as he and the Father are one. And God has answered that prayer in Christ. Our unity, our one body is a present reality that we don't always experience because we don't always express it. So the unity that we need to express is this strengthening and building up of the body. This strengthening that we're intended to experience is contingent on the maturity of its members. So that's what Paul is saying. You have to grow up. You have to grow up or the body isn't going to be strong. And this unity that you're supposed to express to all of creation isn't going to be expressed. So therefore, the expression of this unity in Christ is only, only as evident as we are mature. Let's take a look at um, verse 17. It says this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. I want to stop right there and kind of talk about a couple things in this these two verses real quick. So it says, This I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk do. So we saw in verse one, he said, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. We know now that these two things are not compatible with each other. So no longer walk as the Gentiles do. How do they walk? They walk in the futility of their minds. This word futility is really interesting. It means purposelessness. It means vanity. It means 
worthlessness, the futility of their minds. So they're thinking about things, but they have no aim. They have no direction. And now we know and understand that we do who are we who are in Christ have an aim and have a direction. And so he's saying don't walk in futility, don't walk aimlessly, but walk with purpose according to the calling with which you have been called. And it says this, they are darkened in their understanding. In Ephesians 1, he prays this that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened that we would see, that the lights would come on for us, that we would have a revelation. And he's saying this, if you're walking as the Gentiles walk, they're walking in the darkness of their understanding. They don't have the revelation that we have. And then he says, alienated or cut off from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. I think this is super interesting, this idea of hardness of heart where um, sin hardens our hearts, but also it makes me think of Ezekiel 36, where we see this promise from God of this new covenant. It's in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, and he says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So what he's saying is that sin has hardened your heart. It has actually done something that was that is the antithesis of what you were created. So, so he says, I'm going to take out the heart of stone and I'm going to put a heart of flesh in your flesh. So what I created you to be, I'm going to make you into. I'm going to put my spirit in you. And he's saying this, Paul is saying this, that the Gentiles or those who are not Christ followers, they don't have that the reality of a new heart within them. So their hearts are hardened. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. I think that um, it's St. Augustine who says that sin is humanity curved in on itself. So what he's describing here is a humanity that is constantly and consistently self-referencing. It's self-referencing. And what did we learn from the beginning of this chapter? That, That to be mature... To walk worthy of our calling is to be Christ-referencing. And there is incredible safety and security in that truth. Okay, I want to read you a quote from C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity because he, he says something that helps us to understand this idea of the Gentiles walking. So we have this perpetual motion. You walk and then you become more like who you're walking towards. And so if we're walking towards Jesus, if we're growing up into Jesus, we're becoming more like Jesus. But if we're walking in the ways of people who don't know Jesus, we become more like people who don't know Jesus. So he says this, every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little bit different than what it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning the central thing either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature, either into a creature that is in harmony with God and other creatures and with itself or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is, it is joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state or the other. And that is such a beautiful way to articulate exactly what Paul is talking about here. So let's look at verse 20, because there's something better for us. He says this, but you, but that is not the way you learned Christ. That is not the way you learned Christ. And learned by implication has an ongoing, is an ongoing process. It's not just 
one time. It's ongoing. That's not the way we learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. It's funny that he says this because he just spent a really long time explaining who Jesus was. But here's the other thing. When these house churches were gathering, there would be people, there would be pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles, who would come and who would pour into the people in that church. They would, they would teach them what it looked like to be in Christ. They would teach them what it looked like to be followers of Jesus. They would teach them what it looked like to walk worthy of the calling with which they had been called. And friends, this is a heavy responsibility, and it is not one to be taken lightly, not at all. So he says this, he says, you haven't learned, this is not what you've learned of Christ. So in verse 22, to put off your old self, this is what you learned, which belongs to your former manner of life, which is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So, so really cool about this. So you have these pastors, you have these people who have been stationed in these churches to teach people who Jesus is, okay? And then you have these allusions in verse 22 through um, 24 to Genesis 1 through 3. And so you have this accessibility to the gospel. Like, I understand what that means. But as you go on, as you progress, as you mature, as you learn more and more, you begin to see these things, see these indicators of other portions of scripture. And so he says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Well, in in Genesis 3, we learn that Eve was actually deceived, and she thought she could go her own way. The serpent told her, oh, you're not, you will not surely die. You can eat of this fruit. And she looked at it. She appraised it. She said, hmm, I think that, yes, that is a good decision. So she veered away from the wisdom of God, and she made the decision for herself because she was deceived. Let's look at verse 23. It says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So you see this Genesis 1. You saw the Genesis 3 with the deception. Now you see this Genesis 1 idea. It says to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So in Genesis 1, it says this, let God says, let us make them in our image and in our likeness. And here in verse 24, it says, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So what Paul is saying here is that when Jesus shows up, it's as significant as this creation event that you are to put on your new self, the new reality of your cre- you've been created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So what are, we, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond to this reality? We've put off some things and we've put on something. But then in verse 25, it says this, therefore, okay, having put away falsehood. So we're putting away the deception. We're putting away the lies. We're putting away the deceit of our former life, our former reality. And let each one of you speak the truth to his neighbor. We already talked about what that is. We talked about how the truth is this this in Christ reality. And it doesn't mean that we overtly, we sprinkle in Jesus everywhere. (laughs) But it does mean that we speak with the love of being fully known and fully accepted in Christ. And so we speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So he he's kind of, he's giving us this indicative. He's saying, put away falsehood. And then he's telling us how, speak truth to your neighbor. And then he's telling us why. He's saying, because we are members of one another. And we had you kind of piece this out in the study guide for yourself so we can see if our um, 
these kind of match up a little bit. And then 26, it says, be angry and do not sin. So he's dealing, he's saying anger and do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then he's saying to give no opportunity for the devil. So be angry and do not sin. How can you be angry and do not sin? I think we talked about it at the beginning of this chapter. We talked about how this idea of gentleness is kind of holding the line between anger and never being angry at all. It's being angry at the right things and at the appropriate times. And so when it comes to our relationships with one another, we're looking at it from a position of reconciliation. So where we want to respond in anger, we need to resolve it quickly because we are members of one another and the expression of our unity will only be as effective as we are mature. Okay, so verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. This is incredible, okay, because we're talking about these house churches that are meeting together from all different backgrounds, all different ways of life, and he's saying, let the thief no longer steal. Well, a lot of us would say, if you're a thief, you're just not welcome here, and so don't even come near us. But he's saying, no, let's give this, this person a chance. Don't steal anymore. Where you used to be completely self-referencing, taking for yourself, that is not your way of life anymore, but rather let him work doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So he goes from taking to giving. This is what Jesus does. He go, He takes us. He takes us from taking everything in fear, in fear of loss. And he says, I have given you everything you need. Now you can give like I have given to you. That's really, really good news. So 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. This is, this is really, really tough for us today, especially in the world of, of social media. Think about this word corrupting. Corrupting means this, that, it's, that, that it makes it unstable. You can't, if the words that are coming out of your mouth are tearing down, then it's making the body unstable. And we are members of one another. So when you say things that are tearing down, that are not speaking the truth in love, you are weakening the body of Christ. There is no question about it. Is there space for rebuke? Is there space for saying in love, hey, I want what's best for you. I want, I want you to, I want to see you restored. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that means that you have that conversation with that person in love. And when you go to somebody else and you speak corrupting talk about other members of the body, then you are actually tearing the body down. You are not building it up. And that is the intent of that verse, is that we would build up through our words, through the things that we say, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace, that it may give grace, that it may help those who hear. Okay, and finally, and do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We He's actually, the references, he goes back several times and he's referencing, what have I already said before? In Ephesians 1, he says this in verse 13, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He's saying this, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and you have an inheritance and don't grieve it by tearing down the body. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by, by, by your corrupt talk, by being angry with one another, by stealing from one another, by, be, 
by being completely self-referencing because there are better things for you. And then in verse 31, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Friends, he is talking so much about how we speak to one another, how we treat one another. And when we're fearful and when we're insecure, what comes out of us is fear and insecurity. But what we need to understand and be completely confident in is that we are utterly and completely safe in Christ. And therefore, the response that we want to have so often doesn't need to be the response that we, in fact, have. He says this in verse 32, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Think about this word, tenderhearted compared to the way that he describes the heart of the Gentiles, hardened, calloused. It feels really vulnerable to have a tender heart. Sometimes we think it makes way more sense to protect ourselves, to build up a wall. But God says that wall, it's been torn down in Christ. And now, We are equipped and we've been asked to go in this calling, in this one hope of our calling to build up the body of Christ so that all creation can see, all principalities and powers and rulers can understand and know that God has always known what he's doing. He is all wise, he is all loving, And he wants to express it through his church. The unity, this one body, is a present reality. I can't stress this enough. But the weakness that we often experience in the church is due to our own lack of maturity. Because this is really scary. And that, my friends, is why we have Ephesians 1 through 3. So we can be deeply confident of what we have in Christ, the treasure that we have in Christ, and so that we can express it in the power of the Holy Spirit in the church. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this teaching from Ephesians chapter 4 from Casey. Casey, so much good stuff in this chapter. We saw a lot about maturity. Paul Mm -hmm. continues to talk about the mission. Can you connect the dots for us? Why is it so important that we as believers mature in Christ when it comes to advancing this mission? Um, I think I think it connects to this. I told a story at the beginning of the session where I talked about my own frustration with um, experiencing or being taught this Ephesians 1 through 3 reality mm-hmm. and then not be understanding how to walk it out mm-hmm. in my daily life. And I had this conflict. If God is real, um, then is this what he really intended for us? And the way I see it is, yes, it he is real, but we have to walk it out in our day-to-day mm-hmm. lives in a very practical way so that we can show other people that invite them into the reality of this Ephesians 1 yeah. through 3 existence. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's exactly what Paul's doing for us in Ephesians 4 through 6. Um, he's inviting us into the expression of that that's so um, in Christ reality. So yeah. there are no boring or ordinary parts of this last half of Ephesians. Oh my gosh, no, yeah. not at all. No, I yeah. would say not even close. So we're getting to more of that next week. Yeah. Stephen's going to be that's teaching right. Ephesians chapter 5. What can we expect? Well, uh, the, the, the intensity of the drama is going to turn up. Um, and so this next week, we're going to talk about a people loved and liberated. So in light of what Casey just talked about, Ephesians 1 through 3, and stepping into this life of being loved and liberated, what is asked of us? What does it mean to walk in love? 
And at the end of Ephesians 5, uh, it, we're going to get to maybe a controversial text. Not maybe, it is one of the more controversial texts in Scripture, so I can't wait for us to unpack this together in community. Awesome. Again, if you guys have any questions, email us, bible at churchonthemove.com. But we will see you guys next week. See you then.